thing. I'm trying to record a podcast. Hey, everybody. It's Angela Ardelina with Your Natural Dog. And my guest today is Amy Renz of Goodness Gracious, um, which is a very nice, gently cooked dog food brand. And she's joining me today to talk about endotoxins and why we really need to look at where our um, food is sourced for our pets and um, some of those scary things that we need to look out for and why this is so important, especially if you have a pet that you're not sure what's wrong. They could be suffering from endotoxinemia, which is a buildup of these toxins. So we're going to teach you how to find them, what they are, and how to detox your dog from them. What's coming up next? So this is Bruce. Bruce is a 12-year-old pug, and he has had a lot of issues over his life. But for the past several years, he's had a really weird hacking, coughing issue that no one has been able to get under control. Um, it's nothing infectious. It's just kind of a result of his little flat-faced breed and the respiratory issues they usually deal with. And I have finally found something that worked. It's called Breathe by MycoDog. It's a mushroom extract. And it has been incredible how quickly I saw results. Literally overnight, I saw a difference um, in the hacking and coughing, especially during the night he was doing it. So the breathe tincture has really made a huge difference for him, not only with his breathing, but just overall supporting his immune system since he has two other dogs in our household. They go to daycare every day and bring home various germs and respiratory bugs themselves. And he has been totally healthy and clear of any issues since being on this tincture. So we're just super grateful that finally something is out there for these flat faced breeds to breathe better and live a happier life. And we're back with Amy Renz of Goodness Gracious and we're talking endotoxins, which I know people are like, what the heck are those? Something else I have to worry about. But um, as we just said before we came on, this is kind of reason 942 why you went out and made your own recipes and developed your own food. Um, and we're talking endotoxins because this is just another reason why we want to avoid buying that bag of kibble that's sitting on the shelf um, because it's going to contain endotoxins. What are those? Amy, what are endotoxins? <laughs> sure. Well, you know, endotoxins are important in when, especially when you look at the whole picture of what our pets eat, right? So, very rarely, at least in our pets, do we uh, do we see uh, an acute instance of endotoxemia, right? Um, it's kind of like aflatoxin maybe, where at high levels it can cause aflatoxicosis, right? Or something that's um, an acute illness. But for the most part, it causes and works with other uh, things that are inside that bowl to make our pets sick, right? So... Um, when you look at the whole picture of what our pets eat, you know, there's endotoxins in a lot of it, uh, especially if you're talking about eating kibble or canned food. There are glycotoxins in a lot of that stuff, right? So those are um, a diverse group of, of compounds, but they're caused mostly from uh, cooking and browning things, right? And they cause damage to a gut. There's glyphosate, right? Um, Roundup and all of that stuff. And um, synthetics that are in food that um, can work with endotoxins at certain levels to make conditions worse. Um, imbalanced feeding, for sure. Um, but uh, so endotoxins essentially are um, coming from the word endo and toxin, right? Endo inside of something. So it's a toxin that exists inside. And in this case, it exists inside of a gram, uh, a gram negative bacteria. So, um, crazy. yeah. So what yeah. I think is crazy is that like the whole raw feeding thing there, you know, the FDA is like everything needs to be cooked and killed. That's how we protect ourselves and our pets from getting, you know, exposed to E. coli and, um, salmonella, which I think is hilarious because I, I can't remember which one I had now. Uh, I got E. coli or salmonella whatever one from Peter Pan peanut butter. So I can tell you that cooking <laughs> did not kill that right. um, 
that bacteria, that harmful bacteria. And so what I'm learning is that basically that kill process to get rid of those harmful bacteria, when you ba kill them with that high heat, you're literally making a new toxin, which is this endotoxin, which is the gram negative bacteria, which is that how you say it? Did I say it wrong? Right. So gram negative bacteria would be um, so gram negative, gram positive, right? Gram negative. It just has dead? to do with. Yeah, so they are. So, you, you know, gram negative bacteria would be like E. coli or salmonella or shingella, right? Shingella. And so um, when those pathogens, so think about a piece of chicken, right? That's got salmonella, salmonella on it. And with that piece of chicken just kind of sits there, that some those salmonella bacteria are going to uh, propagate and they're going to grow and there's going to be more salmonella bacteria, right? And so when those cells of bacteria grow, they release um, a little bit of endotoxins as they grow. But mostly what happens is, and the big danger is, is actually when you go to kill all of that salmonella, right? So each, um, each bacteria cell can hold 2 million endotoxin molecules. So an endotoxin molecule is, is, a, is structurally or chemically speaking, it's what they call a lipopolysaccharide. It's just a complex molecule of a fat and a carbohydrate. Um, but when you go and now you've got all of all of those salmonella bacteria that are there and then you go and kill them, they're all going to die. And when they die, they release each one of them is that little house of two million endotoxin molecules. And that's what gets released. And that's generally what makes you sick. Right. From from salmonella um, or, I, or E. coli. I was literally reading um, something online that said like, and this was for humans, like a single meal of a meat, egg and dairy can cause a spike of inflammation within hours that can stiffen one's arteries. And this is wow. because like, imagine if you're getting something that is completely factory farmed, you know, that right. nothing about it is real. The, the animals barely, it's a factory uh, made product. It's not even an animal anymore. Um, and I find it so interesting because this goes with everything. Every time we go and kill something, we go kill a cancer cell. We need to get it out of our body. We still need to get that dead cancer cell out of our body. We kill a bacteria. We still need to get that out. It still causes toxins and then, or it still has a toxic effect. What I think is so amazing is that then throw in aflatoxins, mycotoxins, what was I reading? Uh, propylene glycol. Was it propylene glycol? Yeah. That's a preservative. These things have all been proven to help those endotoxins cause even more damage. Do you know, yeah. can you speak about that a little bit? I, I can. So endotoxins in the body, when they get released generally through like leaky gut kind of thing, like they, they can initiate and perpetuate damage to and diseases of the gut. So um, they can cause leaky gut. And um, so generally what happens is, is those endotoxins then seep into your bloodstream and they're, they're brought to the liver where they're inactivated. Um, too much endotoxin in the liver can damage the liver. But more importantly, when you have endotoxin in the liver in the presence of another substance, they can work together to synergistically damage the liver. Wow. And those other substances don't necessarily have to be toxins. I mean, certainly phar certain pharmaceuticals would do it. Um, but more, more likely it's going to be the presence of like high levels of vitamin A or high levels of iron or high levels of copper. And um, copper is an especially, oops, lost my earbud. Copper is an especially interesting one because of the work that um, Dr. Sharon Center has been talking about, right? Um, so she's been talking about copper associated hepatopathy and it being a, a new. Uh, a, a tragic and nutritionally provoked canine illness. So um, I think my earbud stopped working, but I can, as long as you can hear me, I can, yep. I can hear. But uh, so, um, so she's actually, she gave a presentation to the FDA where she, um, she said, she ac actually asked the FDA to enable manufacturers to override AFCO and change the copper content in their formulations now, because according to Dr. Center, and her working group, objective data validates that dietary copper allowances that have been mandated by AFCO exceed the physiologic tolerance for many healthy dogs. And it's making them sick. It's giving them copper-associated hepatopathy. So that's too much accumulation in the liver, and it's damaging the liver. And, and it's a very insidious disease that you don't really know about it until almost it's too late. 
So because it's mandated by AFCO um, and it's associated with um, copper chelates, so not natural copper per se, she was speaking uh, specifically about um, copper chelate. So it's a copper that's been bound to an amino acid uh, to make it highly bioavailable. So copper chelates have bioavailability of, say, 80%, where the natural copper you might see in oysters, for instance, or liver has more of a bioavailability of around 30 or 40%. And mammals also tend to be really um, adept with regulating natural sources of copper in their diet. So they kind of the more copper they consume, the less they absorb, and they eliminate the excess in stool. But that's not the case with copper chelates. And so they accumulate in the liver. And so that's a real big concern when you talk about now we've got, um, in particular, kibble and canned food with their inedible ingredients being uh, sources of endotoxins, rendered ingredients in particular are really high sources of endotoxins. And that's all in kibble, right? And now we've got this endotoxin that goes to the liver and it meets up with all of that excess copper and synergistically it works together to damage the liver. So, you know, endotoxins are associated with um, a whole host of, of issues. I mean, they can cause lasting damage to organs. Um, wow. Specifically, we see it with... Um, damage to the gut, damage to the liver, and damage to the brain. So um, things like- No, like how did they say that this is what's going on? Like that this was is it what it was attributed to? Because what was so funny about that thing that I said about the human eating the dairy, eggs, and meat was that they used to blame it on saturated fats and used to right. say, oh, you consume saturated fats. That's why that's happening. And that's not the case. It's the fact that they- um, ingested this many endotoxins at one time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a- so they blamed it on something else and that's not it. So that's why, uh, you know, I'm so anti kibble, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when people go, well, what kibble do you recommend? I'm like, anything's better. I'll feed them whatever I'm eating over that because there's so much wrong with it. There's so many things. I, the, right. Just the fact that it can sit on a, a shelf for two years, the preservatives, right. the coloring, the the high heat. I didn't even think about. I, I, of course, knew about mycotoxins and aflatoxins, which I, you know, assumed that the moment that bag is opened, that those start growing. Didn't know it. Didn't even know about the endotoxins. Yeah. I, you brought up something that said, you said rendered meats yeah. rendered as a meal also, or meat meals yeah. or chicken meals, all of those things. I want the audience, I know I have most of my audience are 2.0 pet parents, but some of those may not know what you mean by rendered. Um, sure. And I would love for you to kind of tell them about that. Like, yeah, is this the reason why you did what you're doing? Is that you were just disgusted by <laughs> what you were finding out in the it- pet food industry? It, it is. So, and rendered is a really great conversation to have, especially right now, because um, we're still in the in the stages of going through uh, an avian flu epidemic, right? So this came about, um, it started in late 2021. It hit our shores in the U.S. around 2022. And so we might have, most people might have noticed it in the grocery store when the price of chicken went up and they, that turkey that they went to go buy for Thanksgiving was like three times or four times the cost, right? Mm-hmm. The reason for that was was the avian flu. Now, the risk around uh, rendered ingredients is always there, but it was it's especially, I think, uh, important to talk about now. Um, so, with with the avian flu, um, the the best way I know how to describe rendering and what's happening with the avian flu, right, is to talk about what happens on a farm, right? So, you know, there's there's a chicken, right? And let's call chicken Helen, like you know, and, and Helen was there pecking, clucking, and eking out a living, suffering the daily indecencies and inevitability of being seen as a broiler, right? And and all was going along as it probably usually goes. And then, you know, Florence got sick, right? And so July in Georgia, or these places where there's generally these large chicken farms, are generally hot, right? And so, um, but that's nothing like what, you know, these chickens experience when the avian flu comes in. So there's a major culling. 
the uh, the temperature gets turned up and the ventilation gets shut down in their living quarters. And eventually, over the span of a few hours, they suffer and they die where they where they stand. Um, they're there in a decaying syrup of feces and flies and uh, sawdust and uh, pathogenic bacteria, rising tide of pathogenic bacteria, rising tide of endotoxins, and then they get shoveled out and tossed into the back of a, of a, of a dump truck or a truck that goes to a rendering plant. There was a great article oh several God, years ago. Me? I didn't know that's how this story was going to end. Now, I know oh, yeah. all about the sick diseased animals, but I thought for sure with the avian flu, they'd be like, oh no, hazmat, got to burn that down, whatever. No, I mean, some places are maybe, but, or shoveling and burying them, but no, the FDA allows all of that to be rendered into into pet food. And so, you know, it gets thrown into a back of of a truck and hauled off to a rendering plant. And, you know, there was an article in the Baltimore Sun several years ago, and they interviewed the manager, the general manager of a, um, of a rendering plant. His name was, I remember his name. It was Neil Gagan. And he said, by the time we get them, they're soup. <laughs> so, you know, and they all have of to be getting sick, inhaling. Yeah. Right. So those toxins are. Yeah. And so th- there have been instances of people that work in rendering plants getting sick from toxic, toxic exposures to, you know, the off gassing from decayed flesh. And, um, but, you know, all of that, even 40 animals that aren't quite dead. Uh, get out tossed in there. Um, grocery store garbage, roadkill. Just recently, Susan Thixton reported on yep. dog DNA being found again in dog food. So, you know, where does that come from? You know, right. that's and, that's and more often have than that. not a euthanized animal. And Absolutely. Pencil we had it exactly found it in, in the food that killed all of the dogs back when was it? Right. 2018. I can't remember yeah, now. I so. Not even right. that long ago. And what people right. don't understand is that they are taking euthanized animals and putting it in the dog food and again rendering it with all of these other uh disease decaying animals and then yeah, chemicals them. too chemicals you know so we don't know what happens we know that um phenobarbital kills a dog we don't know what happens when you put a whole bunch of dogs that have been put down or horses or farm animals whatever and then bake them at high heat we don't right. know so- what happened and they don't care no, they don't. You know, and even like cattle, right? They still have the uh, pesticide ear tags still attached to their, you know, to their ears. They they end up in there. Your know, grocery store garbage that's still in its styrofoam and plastic containers ends up in there. The other twenty five percent of the, so I mentioned seventy five percent, I think, of the um, avian flu, you know, birds that are called are called by that method, right? That that thermal method. The other twenty five percent are pretty much called by fire retardants. So. You know, those things end up in there. And, you know, eventually they go into a pit. There's this auger that pulverizes everything into 40 millimeter particulates and slop. It's heated, uh, which takes a lot of heat, like 270 degrees for four hours and pressure and all of that to separate fat from protein and create this powder that's a that's a protein powder. That's a meal, chicken meal, turkey meal, whatever it is, um, rendered some rendered fats and um you know all of that pathogenic bacteria yeah that that got destroyed in that rendering process but it released an exponentially greater amount of endotoxins into that food and um so you know those those meat meals those chicken meals those poultry fats that end up in kibble you know, yeah, they they might not necessarily they they might have been sterilized to take out the uh, the pathogenic bacteria, but they're but they're loaded with endotoxins, and you know, at, like I said, at, at unmanageable levels, they they initiate and damage and damage the gut. Uh, well, we have to take pre- a short break. Oh, when we come back, we're going to talk about what are signs maybe that your pet or even you might be suffering from from this what we can do to detox and how we can maybe avoid these kind of foods altogether when we come back. Sounds great.
with Amy Renz of Goodness Gracious, and we're talking about endotoxins uh, and all of the disgusting crap that goes into these cheap <laughs> kibble foods and why I can never, ever get behind any of them. Um, I can't even get behind factory farming. Um, you even mentioned before we went on break, you know, that they do do some sort of sterilization with chemicals, but they're chemicals. There's still some sort of god awful chemical. Um, so this is why I'm so passionate about it. And whenever I find a brand that is using not only human grade, but making things that um, our dogs feed or fought dogs and that they're actual medicine. We all know that saying, let food be thy medicine, but food can only be that medicine if it's, you know, eating, you know, that the animal is eating what it should and living the way it should. Otherwise, it won't have all those nutrients that we're supposed to be getting from it. Instead, we're getting poison and toxins from them. So what are some things people, A, what's the easiest way to avoid this? Because it's found in, in canned food. Um, that means do we have to worry about anything that is cooked or baked that we need to be aware of these? So, and would the goal be to make sure that those bacteria aren't present in the first place? Right. So I think, you know, the first uh, part of that um, is to select foods where you know that the ingredients that go in them are edible, right? So, um, that would be selecting like a human grade food, right? Because they're licensed and inspected to mean that they are human edible ingredients and produced in a in a way and in a place that um, that follows good manufacturing practices, right? So that while that might not necessarily the flavor of that food might not necessarily appeal to your taste, you can eat it, right? Um, kill you, <laughs> right? Um, in fact, it's probably one of the more healthier things. <laughs> I look at, at what I feed my dogs and I'm like, they eat better than me, right? We have t-shirts that say my dog eats better than me. Yeah. Um, you know, raw food wouldn't qualify as a human grade um, because they're, it's raw, um, but there are really great raw food companies. And so you know, the only way that I would know how to uh, coach somebody on picking a quality raw food is to talk to the manufacturer, right? Um, because you, you, a good trick I think I learned from Susan Thixton, right, was to say, how many, uh, what do you have for refrigeration or for freezer space? Because a lot of places that make kibble, for instance, don't necessarily have things under refrigeration. So, um, but the the main reason, the, the main way is to either pick a human grade food or to uh, purchase from a manufacturer that you, you know you can trust. Um, so when it says human grade, can't just anybody put that on there on their packaging? so on their website they can put it on there but on their packaging not by not by uh, regulation so by regulation by AFCO regulations and that that of all the things that don't get enforced in pet food I have to say from sitting on the hot seat on that one that that, that is one of the things that is intensely regulated you know we That's have cool. to document yeah it's really great I mean we have to to document to um each state in in which we sell uh, our food that, you know, these are our certificates of analysis on our ingredients. Um, these are, uh, you know, third party inspection. Um, and are audit, those all of that. those types of things, are they available on like your website? Like if they go to goodness gracious or is it not available because it's not common practice? Because, you know, that's happening to me in my industry is right. hemp industry says we follow the hemp industry, not the pet industry, not what NASC has and not what anybody else has to say, just what the experts have to say. And they said, this is how we're going to self-regulate. We're going to test all of our batches and provide a third party analysis. You know, you scan a QR code, takes you to that COA, but nobody else is doing it. So because it's costly. So to me, I'm always like, well, why don't I go to when I go to buy an essential oil? Why don't I see a COA? When I go buy a food, why don't I get to see their COA that shows me that it doesn't have all of those things in it? Right. Um, right. So it's funny because that's what we tell people to do is go find that COA, but they can't. Nobody's got one right. up. So right. It's <laughs> you're, not... like, you're the only one doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, they could, they could go um, and find the, um, uh, like either speak to the, the state in which, uh, where the, uh, plant is located because they would have to have a, a license, right, to make human food. And that would be- But human grade is 
will be is a good thing to know that we're we're going to be right. safe from these things because right. they're not allowed On a label. to do this. They're not allowed to do this in human food, right? We're exactly. we're not eating avian dead animals and no, euthanized. No, no, you got it right. Yeah, got it. So human grade on the label. What right. what are some um, other things that people can look for? So a, a balanced diet, right, is is big. And um, so high protein, moderate fat, healthy fats, right? Not not saturated fats, but you know a good omega three to uh, a good omega six to omega three ratio is going to help protect the gut. And green leafy vegetables, like you know, it's a surprising how few formulations out there have respectable amounts of green leafy vegetables in them, right? I mean, you, um, I, I saw uh, an industry-wide study that said that it was um, some, something like eight times more um, sugar is sold to go into pet foods than, than kale. You know, it's, it's crazy. There's more salt that's sold to go into pet foods than spinach. And spinach is the number one dark green leafy vegetable you might find in any kind of in a kind of pet food but but so good amounts of dark green leafy vegetables and the reason for that is that um, the fiber that's in them right as well as a compound called thylakoids um, works together to um, to protect the lining of the GI tract and prevent endotoxins from entering where they shouldn't, you know, they just kind of go, you know, they go right through and get handled as, as they should. In the which I read, which is one of the um, kind of purposes of omega threes also is to kind of help get these endotoxins out and protect uh, the gut lining. Also, um, what uh, what are some signs that maybe someone's pet is and what is the term? Endotoxemia? Does that mean? Endotoxemia. I, you, I, you would know that. I mean, you're, the dog would be very sick, right? Um, GI yeah, it's, distress. It's one of those things where we're, you know, don't know what's wrong. They can't find anything, but your dog is clearly not feeling well. It's got GI right. upset. I, I mean, right. I mean, think about how you felt when you had some manila poisoning, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it would manifest uh, at a Well, I thought GI. I was dying. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only time besides when I was born that I went to a hospital because yeah. I thought I was dying. I it yeah. I surely and I couldn't believe that I got it from Peter Pan peanut butter. Haven't eaten it <laughs> to, to, to this day. Yeah. Um yeah. and what are ways that is this uh we talked about omegas, how since it goes to the liver and it's being captured in the liver, is detoxing the liver For uh, sure something they should do? Do you sure. have any suggestions on some natural ways, um, things we can incorporate or give them to help them? To I'm them? sure you do, too. I do. <laughs> but I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, so, you know, the first things I always think about with liver detox would be things like milk thistle, right? And uh, and Sam and Sammy. Right. I mean, those are the kind of the two things that, you know, I reach for those things all the time. Like, you know, I, I, I hate some of the uh, pharmaceuticals and things that I might have to give to my dogs living here in New England for certain times of the year. Right. And so so those are those are things I, I always reach to. But um, but I, I think you have some really great ideas. So <laughs> I, I love milk thistles, one of my favorite adaptogens. Um, and remembering that, um, what about mushrooms? Have you uh, yeah. have any experience in feeding mushrooms? Because they're such an amazing functional food. Are I they, do. Are they allowed in food? I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah I was sure. like, because I remember asking this about hemp. I'm like, why isn't hemp seed, hemp protein in dog food? It's the greatest. And then I found out about it's not on the grass list, the generally recognized as safe. Okay. okay. Yeah. And it never will be, because, you know, <laughs> mean old yeah, that, hemp, it's so evil, right? But right. Um, that's so that I was like, well, you never, I never see mushrooms in any formulations. And I was like, oh, maybe they're not allowed, but they are. Yeah, they are. And they're, they're wonderful uh, tonics for like immune system support, right? I mean, they're, they're fantastic um, for that. So, and, uh, and, and great when you're talking about supporting a liver and supporting detoxification, so. And what about fasting? Is fasting another? Um, I I find it fascinating that one of the things I learned about fasting or even feeding like in the daytime only, like feeding your dogs one time in the morning and not the rest of the, the day, like a, not a 
dinner time also, is that you're literally giving the liver the chance to do what it's supposed to at right. night instead of dealing with food and um, it's it's detoxifying and healing yep. instead. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, um, uh, you know, not not feeding the dog all day long, you know, is great. I, I also think that looking at the whole picture of what they eat is especially important. So, um, you know, we talked and touched just briefly upon glycotoxins, right? So glycotoxins, for instance, are um, they're produced in the body, but they're also ingested in what uh, what our dogs eat. So they're made in that browning process. So when you bake or fry um, a sugar and an, and an amino acid together. So we make gently cooked food. It's steamed. So we don't introduce glycotoxins into any of our food, but you would see it a lot in, um, in kibble and canned foods. In fact, a study by a large pet food company said that dogs who eat kibble are exposed to 122 times the glycotoxins levels of humans on a mig per kig basis. And if you eat canned food, you're exposed to 169 times the levels of glycotoxins. So, you know, glycotoxins are one of those things that work to damage the gut. You know, they're, they're tightly tied to chronic low-level inflammation, metabolic syndrome, and diet-related pathology. So metabolic syndrome being that, you know, gut, that, you know, fat around the middle, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, blood glucose um, imbalances or inability to, yeah, to regulate. linked all this for, through research to yeah. uh, these endotoxins. So she, you're not just saying this willy-nilly. This has literally already been researched and it is on here. So it's not, we know this. So this is why it's important for us to avoid them, know where our food comes from, and especially know where our pet's food comes from, how it is manufactured so that we can make sure we're getting living good food so that food can be thy medicine. I did, my um, dogs loved your food. They oh, had yay. <laughs> the rabbit and turkey. I loved the rabbit. It was so beautiful. It looks beautiful and they love it. Thank you for being um, one of those amazing people out there who's doing the right thing in the industry. I really appreciate you. Really appreciate you being on my show and uh, educating us about these awful toxins. How do people find out more about you? Oh, um, well, uh, goodnessgraciousco.com is our website. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, um, Facebook, and, uh, and LinkedIn. And, awesome. uh, and I hope to see you again at another stop for Dr. Judy's tour. Yes, we will. We'll be there. Uh, next one's coming up in, uh, uh, in Illinois, right? Chicagoland. Yep, Chicago. Yay, good. I'll see you there. Thank Yay. you, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Bye-bye.